Good morning, Connecting Point. Would you stand to your feet and help us worship this morning?
Take control 
Will you guys pray with me? God, we come before you and uh, are just grateful uh, to be in your presence today, God, and to be in community with one another, God. And um, your presence is here, God. But I just pray that where there is chaos, uh, in the lives of the people in this room and on this stream online, God, that you'll bring peace. Where there is fear, that you'll be, bring strength. Where there is confusion, that you'll bring clarity, God. Uh, we just pray that you will move in a mighty way today in this room and on this platform, God, and we just trust you with that. I just pray that, that we as a church, we as a community, um, I just ask that you'll make us a place that, that people come and not only feel like they belong, uh, but feel like they can connect to other believers, to other people, and most importantly, that we're a place that they connect to you, God. I pray as we go out in the community and in our everyday lives, God, that people see us and see us as a people of connection, a people um, that will connect people to you, and we just trust you with that, that God. We pray over Pastor Doug today uh, as he delivers um, your word today, God. We just pray that you'll speak through him. We're thankful for the ways you've prepared him, uh, and we're thankful. And I just want to praise you for the ways you're going to use him today, God. We pray as we leave this room later on today uh, that we'll walk out of here as people that look less like the world and look more like you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, you guys can grab a seat. And for those of you who don't know, I'm Pastor Brad. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and we just want to take a quick moment here uh, and just welcome you and thank you for worshiping with us this morning, whether you're here with us in the building or if you're worshiping with us online. Uh, and we also want to let you know about what we call uh, our central hub. So if you're here with us on the building, uh, on the posts in the worship center, there's a QR code as well as up on the screen behind me. If you get your phone out, open your camera app and point it at any of those QR codes, uh, a link will pop down. You can click on, and that'll take you to our central hub. If you're with us online, that link will be provided directly in the chat, and you can click on that. It'll take you to the exact same place. Um, and the central hub's where you can kind of get all things connecting point. You can see our upcoming events, um, as well as register for some of our upcoming events. It's where you can see prayer requests and submit prayer requests. You can get in contact. <laughs> Uh, with a staff member of the church office through there. Um, it's also where you can do your online giving, so your tithes and offering, your reoccurring giving, or if you want to make a one-time donation to a certain ministry or, or, or organization, uh, it can be found on there. Uh, but most importantly, if you're new here, if this is your first time worshiping with us, whether that's in person or online, uh, there's a tab that just says, I'm new, and we would love if you would fill out Click on that and fill out the form for us. It's just a few simple, easy questions. Um, and then after service, if you'll meet me at the next steps table, which is out in our lobby in front of our You Belong Here wall, we have a couple different gift options for you to choose from. We'd love to get in your hand. And if you don't have a phone on you or you don't have service in here or unable to uh, use it in here, at that next steps table after service, uh, we'll have some iPad stations set up. Uh, that you can come and use and you can get on the central hub uh, and do any of those things I just listed that you need to do. And also, as we're starting our year, uh, we're in a vision series. Pastor Doug's talking about uh, kind of the four words uh, that we focus on as our vision of connecting point. And we have these shirts that I'm wearing. And I know the whole time I've been up here, you guys have been like, wow, Pastor Brad looks so good today. That is an awesome shirt. I want one. Well, the good news is we have some. Uh, so at the Next Steps table after service, if you want one, uh, we have these for sale for $10. That's what we paid for them. We don't make money off of them or anything. Um, so if you want one, you can come find us at that Next Steps table after service, and we'll get you one of these. But man, we're grateful that you're here today, and we're grateful for those of you uh, that are plugging in online. We believe that God has a word for you today. Uh, I don't believe that God is a God of coincidence or accidents. I believe he's a God that puts the right people in the right place at the right time, and I'm choosing to believe that these are the right people in the right place at the right time today. So we're excited you're here with us. We live in a world that in many ways is more connected than ever before. 
yet at the same time, we're more disconnected than ever before. We believe that what the world needs more than anything is a church that can help connect the disconnected. A place where everyone belongs and isn't just friendly, but where you can genuinely find a friend. Where regardless of where you are on your spiritual journey, you have space to ask questions, grow, and develop. Where everyone uses their talents to serve each other and their community. We are Connecting Point. You belong here. Well, good morning. Welcome. Are you glad to be here today? Yeah, good. Well, we're glad that you're here too. You picked a good Sunday to be here at Connecting Point. We're in the second week of a series that we started last week. We're calling it This Is Us. And uh, as Brad mentioned, we're talking about uh, vision, who God has called us to be as a church, and then what he has called us to do. And if you remember last week, we began, and uh, I shared a couple things with you, but one of the things that I hope you took away from when it comes to vision Vision always belongs with being who God has called us to be, but it doesn't stop there. That it should result in doing, and both of those are very important, that we, we need to know who God has called us to be, and then out of that, what God has called us to do. And uh, we, there's always action, so being and doing are both important, and uh, we, we're, we're on the lookout, and the best way to kind of have the greatest visions are to see what God is up to, and then just jump in and do that. So we're on the lookout for what God is doing. And so as a church, we, we've wrestled through that and, and we've tried to develop some language uh, that helps us understand kind of who we believe God has called us to be as a church. And, and so we, we put together kind of a vision statement. Um, to all of that, to who we believe God is calling us to be. In fact, we're going to put that vision statement up on the, the screen, and I want us to just read this out loud together. I think we need to remember who God has called us to be. I said last week that vision has a tendency to leak, and so we need to talk about it. We need to keep it in front of us. We need to have language that helps us to understand this, and so we're just going to read this out loud together. This is who we collectively have said we believe that God has called us to be okay so are you ready we're going to read this out loud we'll do it on the count of three that way we're all on the same page at the same time and not all over the board but uh here we go one two three our vision is to be a church where everyone belongs and can genuinely connect grow and serve jesus and each other that's our vision this is who we yeah that's a good vision Good. I'm glad Pastor Brad likes that vision. That's good. We won't fire you this week because you bought into the vision. So that's good. But we, we believe from that, that that God is kind of calling us to four primary values that are represented in that statement. We Brad mentioned earlier the four words that ought to be important to us. Belong, connect, grow, and serve. And, and last week we began by focusing a little bit on the importance of the belonging piece. This morning I want to talk to you and focus on the connecting piece. I am, I'm just convinced that, that God has just kind of hardwired into us. We're innately made this way, but we are, have been created for connection. For, first of all, every single person on this planet has this deep need that's been hardwired into them to be connected with our creator. Regardless of, of who you are, when, when, when you were created, you were created with this deep innate need. It's just been kind of hardwired into you, whether you recognize it or not, to be connected to your creator. And I know there are some people, maybe some who are here this morning and some maybe who are joining us online that's saying, you know, not me. I don't, I don't, I don't even know if I believe in a creator. I, I don't know if I believe in God or anything like that. Well, well, I would argue that even amongst those folks, there still is this deep, intrinsic need to connect with something greater than yourself may not recognize what it is, may not fully understand it or acknowledge it as a need to connect with God, but it still exists. This is why people who, who say they don't even believe in God per se still have interest in things like, like the paranormal 
or interest in things like extraterrestrials. You know, I don't believe in God, but, but I do believe in aliens, that there's, that there's just this need to con- connect with and acknowledge that there's something greater than me out there. This is why today, those of you who are familiar with NA and, and AA and NA and AA circles, there's the acknowledgement of the need for the intervention from a higher power, a power that's greater than ourselves. In fact, uh, for those of you who are familiar with AA and NA, you know that steps two and three say what? They say, we, we came to believe that, uh, that, that only a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And then we go on to say we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. And so we, we all have this deep need with each in each every, and every one of us. And of course, we, as Christians, we believe, we understand God uh, through the person of Jesus Christ. And so there's this need within each and every one of us, regardless of who we are, to, to connect with God along with the need if we're going to be healthy and whole and be all that God has created us to be, to surrender our will and our lives over to him. And yet we live in a culture that totally resists all that. We just sang that song, I surrender all. And there, there's something inside of people that's like, man, I don't want to surrender. I want to conquer. You know, that this is the way our culture is, is created. In fact, I, I wonder this morning, how many here uh, have, have heard this phrase that it's become a really popular phrase, especially in, in our, our culture over the past few years? I hear people say this all the time. They, they say this phrase, um, you know, man, you, you do you. Man, anybody ever heard that or said that before? It's kind of that phrase, you know, you do you, man. You do you, I'll do me. And this has kind of become a, a popular uh, mantra that our current culture has just kind of adopted. You know, this, this you do you and all do me kind of thinking. It's, it's the idea that especially, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, things like morality, that there are no absolutes, that what's right for you may not be right for me. And so, you know, you just do you and, and stay out of my business, you know? That's, that's kind of the thinking, which, which really is, is just kind of a, a modern rephrasing of an older saying, which was popular back for my generation. Some of you may remember this. You used to say, you know, just be yourself. Just be, you be yourself, which, which the idea of, um, you know, this whole idea of uniqueness, of being yourself, is actually a biblical idea. The Bible teaches us that God created us each as uh, unique individuals, and all of us have our own unique passions and talents and abilities, and, and, and we do need to personally live into who God created us to be as individuals. However, that, that's not really what this movement is saying. In fact, the basis of all this, where it comes from, is it's really rooted in this narcissistic belief that the most important thing on this planet is me. That, that I'm the most important and what, what I want matters most and so I should be able to do whatever it is that I wanna do regardless of the collateral damage that it causes to anybody else. You do you really means stay out of my business. Mind your own business. Don't tell me how to live my life. I mean, you do you, but don't you dare say anything about me being me. And what's really behind this you do you philosophy is the deep-seated belief that's become prevalent in this culture that we live in is that if people are just allowed to... Um, completely express themselves, however it is that they want to express themselves, uninhibited, then if I can just do whatever it is that I want to do, whatever um, I think is best, whatever makes me feel good, if I can just express myself however I want, then finally, I'll be happy. That happiness is found in me just being able to do whatever it is that I want to do. The, the only problem with that, and 
Actually, there are multiple problems with it, but the primary problem is that, that self-expression and um, self-glorification, instead of leading to any kind of, of, of freedom and happiness, instead, it only leads to self-absorption and self-centeredness. The truth is, and this is such a a hard thing for so many people to wrap their brains around, but the truth is, the more that I focus on me, the more broken my life ends up becoming. The more that we focus on us, the more that we make it about us, the more broken our lives end up becoming because here's the, the problem for most people. You doing you is what got you into trouble in the first place, right? Me doing me is what got me in, are you guys with me here? Anybody out there? Bueller, Bueller. Come on, you doing you is what caused most problems in your life. This is why the the writer of Proverbs write this, he says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but in the end, he says it leads to death. In other words, left to our own devices, that, that left to you know me, I wanna do what I wanna do, and this is what I think is best, and so I'm gonna be me, and I'm gonna do what I wanna do. So many times, in the end, that leads us down a road that we never ever thought we would ever wind up. You doing you, man, is a trap. I love what Dennis Kinlaw, who was a former president of Asbury College, once said. He said that that Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse of personal autonomy. He he says, uh, Satan never asks us to become his servants. Never once did Satan say to Eve, hey, Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commitment is never from Christ to evil, Ken Law says, it's always from Christ to self. And instead of God's will, self-interest now rules, and what I want reigns, and Ken Law ends by saying, and that is the essence of sin. This whole idea of, of self-will, and I know what's best for myself. Now, I say all that to say this. The true answer for happiness and freedom, if you're looking for the true answer, the true answer is not to look further within ourselves. The answer, I mean, in ourselves, that's where selfishness and sin abounds. The, the, the answer is not in what the world says, where we have a world saying, you know, you do you, express yourself, do whatever feels good to you. That's where happiness and joy and freedom is found. No, the Bible says that true happiness and freedom will never be found through self-fulfillment. In fact, according to Scripture, it tells us that true freedom and true happiness can only be found by connecting ourselves to one who is greater than ourselves. Connecting ourselves to Jesus. I'll keep going if you, you know... You guys know that keep it up and amen and clapping is like saying sick them to a bulldog, so. <laughs> I think this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about, this whole idea um, in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, and, and Paul, the great apostle who wrote like most of what we consider to be our New Testament, he's reflecting back on his life in Philippians chapter 3. And in verse 8 he says this, He says, what is more? Now, he's just been talking about all of his accolades, everything that people would look at and say, man, that makes you something. And Paul says, what is more? I consider everything a loss. In other words, Paul says, everything that I've ever accomplished in my life, everything that I thought was awesome, everything I did, everything I experienced, everything I chased, everything I went after in my life before Jesus, Paul says, I consider all of it a loss. Why? He says, because of or compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
for whose sake I have lost all things. And then Paul goes on to really drop it. He says, I consider all that stuff garbage that I may gain Christ. In other words, even the good stuff, I consider that stuff, when you compare it to Christ, it's garbage. Here's what Paul is saying. He's saying everything that I chased in my life, Everything that I thought would bring me happiness, everything that I thought would bring me fulfillment and make my life have meaning, all of it turned out to be nothing but a huge pile of garbage when I compare what my life is now once I discovered Christ, once I encountered Christ, once I got connected to Christ, all this stuff before, it just looks like garbage to me. You know, and and we we get trapped in that. We, 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 what, he, what he's saying here is he's saying is you doing you will never result in the fulfillment and the freedom that you're looking for. Chasing whatever, you know, we fall into the trap of thinking is going to make us happy. And we all do it. I mean, because there's so much that bombards us in this culture. It's like this will make you happy and this will make you happy. And, and it's all designed to get your money. But, but all the stuff that we fall into the trap of chasing, you know, if, if I just could have the right career, if I just made enough money, if, I, if, if, we, if we just owned our own home, you know, if, if we, now that we own our home, you know, if we just had a nicer home, now that we have a nicer home, if we could just get out of debt because now we're up to our eyeballs in debt because we're up to here in mortgage payments. If I, if I just had that right relationship, If I could just get out of this relationship. If we could just have kids, or once you have kids, if those kids would just behave, if those kids would just get out of my house. (laughs) You know, if we could just do whatever it is, that if I could just do whatever it is I wanted to do, you know, if people would just leave me alone and stay out of my business, and if I could, if I could just, you know, if I could smoke that, shoot that, drink that, then finally I'll be happy, at least for a moment. And Paul says, all of that stuff, it's garbage. Because none of it leads to freedom. The truth is that all of it is simply a trap that leads to bondage. Paul says, if you really want freedom, true freedom can only be found through connecting with your creator. True freedom can only be found through connecting with the one who designed you. I mean, who better to know how to, you should operate your life than the one who created you? You know, there, there are times that I will get something. I don't know, you know, a, a piece of equipment or a tool or, or um, you know, technology. It's like a phone, something like that. And I'm overwhelmed by it. I don't know how it's supposed to operate. The way to find out how it operates, go back to the people who designed it. They'll tell you how it's supposed to run. And so we need to do that in our own personal lives is is we've got to be connected to Jesus if we really want to have fulfillment and freedom in our lives. This is the most important thing in the world. Everything, Everything rises and falls on our connection with Jesus, whether we're connected with him or not. In fact, you've heard me say this lots of times before, and you're going to hear it lots of times, I'm sure, in the future, because I believe this with all my heart. I believe that there are only two kinds of people in this world. We like to classify people in all kinds of places, but when you boil it down, there's really only two kinds of people in this world. There are people who are already connected with Jesus, and there are people who haven't connected with him yet. That's all there is. And so our mission as a church, which is birthed out of our vision, is very simple. In fact, not only do we have a, a, a vision statement, we have a mission statement. And our mission is simply this, is that Connecting Point Church of the Nazarene exists simply to connect disconnected people to Jesus. That's why we're here. This is why we exist. This is why we come and do what we do. First and foremost, to make sure that anybody who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus has the opportunity to get connected to him and know him. That's why we're here. In fact, in fact we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this right now. Um, typically, we, we kind of wait to the end of the service, but I don't think we ought to wait this morning. If you came in this place, if you're joining us online and you've never been connected to Jesus, why not take the opportunity to do it right now? 
I mean, there's no better time than the present. Or maybe at one point in time you were connected to Jesus, but you've kind of strayed away from Jesus. There's no better time to get reconnected to him right now. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite everybody in this place to, to, to bow your heads and close your eyes. The way to get connected to Jesus is really simple. It's a decision followed by a commitment. It's a decision that says, Jesus, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose to follow you. I'm going to choose to give my life to you. And, and then it, it's, a, it's a commitment that I'm going to obey you from this point forward. I'm going to actually follow you. And so if you're here this morning and you'd like to do that, we're going to do this right now. Is just in the quietness of your own heart, I want to invite you to pray a prayer like this. You can put it in your own words, but, but Jesus today, just pray that Jesus today, I choose you. I'm making that choice. I deliberately choose you. I admit that I need you. I need you to forgive me of my sin. I need you to, I need you to change my life. I need you to do for me what I've not been able to do for myself. And so I'm choosing today to accept what you did for me on the cross. And I'm committing all of my life to you. I commit to follow you and not to live by my own wisdom or desires anymore. And I want to thank you because your word says that if we ask, we receive. And so I've asked and I believe I'm receiving today. I want to thank you for receiving me and accepting me. With every head still bowed and nobody looking around, I just want to invite you this morning, if you prayed that prayer, either for the first time or as a recommitment this morning, would you, would you just let me know by lifting your hand real quick? Nobody's going to call you out. Yeah, thank you. All over. Thank you. Yeah. If you prayed that prayer, hey, I prayed that prayer. I made that decision. This is my first act of obedience. Thank you. You can put your hands down. All right, everybody heads up. Let's say yay Jesus, because we got a bunch of new people in the family. You're connected to Jesus now. Man, that's worth the price of admission. Ain't nothing better than that. There's nothing better than that. To just, to just receive Jesus. All right. We could be done, but we're not going to be done yet. Because not only do we believe that it's important to be connected to Jesus, but, but then in order to take the next steps and kind of live that out, we believe it's important that you get connected with other believers. The, the world may say, you do you, but the body of Christ says, we need to do us. In fact, one of the assumptions of Scripture is that once a person makes a decision to follow Jesus, that they'll do that in the context of community. There's never been any intent to have like Lone Ranger Christians, no solo Christians. The, the Bible doesn't leave any room for that. In fact, this idea of following Jesus, if you read through your Bible, it's sprinkled, uh, is in, in the context of community, it's sprinkled all throughout the pages of Scripture. An example of that is in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. It, it says this, the writer of Ecclesiastes, and this is wisdom stuff, so we don't want to lean on our own wisdom. We lean on the wisdom from God. This is wisdom stuff. The writer of Ecclesiastes says that two are better than one. Why? Because they have a good return for their labor. In other words, you ever heard of the word synergy? That two people working together can accomplish more than two people working individually? That's what this is talking about. For if either of them falls, then the other one will lift his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, the writer says, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And in verse 12, and if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And it goes on to say a cord of three strands. So you and somebody else and Jesus is not quickly torn apart. And so what the Bible is teaching us is that as followers of Jesus, it's important for us as believers to foster relationships with other believers. We need to be connected to the church body. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, and let us consider how we, we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. 
but instead encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. We're not intended to do life alone. We are called, we need to connect with other followers of Jesus. You see, here's the cool thing about Jesus. And this is, is, this is something that a lot of people don't understand, but one of the great benefits that comes along with choosing to follow Jesus is that when you choose Jesus, you don't just get Jesus, you also get his bride, which is the church. We don't get just Jesus. We get all the people of Jesus, too. And this is why that, that oftentimes when, when uh, the Scripture talks about the, the church, it uses metaphors like the church is a body comprised of many parts. And, and what part of the body can survive on its own? It's not like, you know, you go walking around and it's uncommon to see an eyeball just kind of out on its own. You know? That'd be weird and gross and everything else. It's meant to be part of a body, or the church is a building comprised of many parts. You know, whenever there's a building that's constructed, there's, there's concrete and cement and, and there's wood and there's nails. And there. Imagine a church building where, you know, there was a bunch of, of lumber or any kind of building. There's a bunch of lumber but no nails to hold it together. Dude, you might be the nails. The church needs you. And so there's, there's all these parts. We're not called to do life alone. We're called to connect with other followers of Jesus. And, and um, we get his bride. And which means, and this is, again, the lights are in my face, but I want to make sure y'all are, yeah, this is way better news than a lot of your faces are saying right now. Some of your faces are looking like, we get you, we get stuck with you. No, you get to have me. This is good news, because what it means is, we don't have to do life alone. There should never be such thing as a lonely Christian. That, that should not exist, because we're not created to, to do life alone. If you're in Jesus you're not just part of a church, you're part of a family. Jesus taught us that if we're gonna be true followers of his, we cannot do it in isolation. Even Jesus didn't do it in isolation. He invited 12 and 72, and he had three really close buddies that wherever they went, you know, Jesus invited them to go with them. In fact, I love John because he had a really good view of himself, and he's like, you know, whenever he talks about himself, he's like, I'm the one that the, the, the master loves. I'm the beloved of Jesus. In other words, man, he just loves hanging out with me. But even if Jesus needed that, how much more do we need that? In fact, somebody needs to, to write this down. Our commitment to God is always lived out through our relationships with other people. The, the commitment that we have, if, if, our, if, if we say we have a commitment with, with God, but that's not being lived out and realized through relationships with other people around us, then we don't really have a commitment to God. Because our call is to follow, right? Our call is to obey. So, so we can't say we're followers if we don't follow. And so our commitment to God is always lived out through our relationship with other people. And, and while we may live in this culture that idolizes individualism, and, you know, we're, where we, 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 we idolize Lone Rangers, we, we think, you know, people who appear to be strong and self-sufficient and have carved their own way out in the world, and, you know, we idolize people like Frank Sinatra who's saying, you know, I did it my way. You got about 50% that know who Frank Sinatra is, so I just dated myself. But, but the Bible tells us that that's not the way to follow Jesus. In fact, I would be so bold as to say that we cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus if we're not deeply connected to and committed to the church that Jesus created and died for and then commissioned us to carry. I mean, this was his plan. In fact, the truth is, it is impossible, I believe, to follow and obey Jesus without connecting to his body or his church. This whole idea of just you and me, Jesus, man, it's a, it's a fallacy, it's a lie, and it's totally unscriptural. 
I mean, think about it. If, if following Jesus actually means following him, doing what he did, obeying what he commanded us to do, one, one of the things that Jesus commanded us to do is he said, go make disciples. Well, how can you make disciples alone? Well, I'm discipling myself. You can't disciple yourself. You gotta be in the proximity of other people to make disciples. You gotta be connected to other people to make disciples. One of the things that Jesus said is, you know, uh, love one another. Well, how can you love other people if you're not around other people? You know, we got to be in the, in the proximity of the other people. Jesus said that we're to love one another um, the way that he's loved us. we got to love each other the same way. And by the love that we show for each other, that's how people will know that we're his followers. Now listen, Jesus is not talking here about loving people who don't know him, which we need to do that. We're supposed to do that. But here's what he's talking about here. When he says love one another, who he's talking about is us. We're supposed to love each other. And and, and how can we love each other if we're not with each other? You You can't love someone without hanging out with them. You can't love people without gathering together with them. You can't love people without investing in the relationship with other people. Loving people can only happen through the context of investing in relationships, investing in the community, by connecting yourself to other believers. You see, we gotta get this. The church is not a social club where, you know, we attend once in a while and then just kinda go on with our life. It's not... It's not a set of programs. It's not a a bunch of events or a building. The church, according to Scripture, is a community of people committed to living and serving together to see life change happen in the world. That's what a church is. In fact, some of you might want to write this down. The church is God's strategy for reaching and redeeming the world, and he didn't make it optional. Amen, Doug. I'm preaching 90% better than you're responding right now. The, 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 church is, <laughs> the church is God's strategy for reaching the world. It's not an option. All right. Let me, let me see if we can, we can convince you a little bit more. I, I wanna, I'm going to give you three invaluable ben- benefits to becoming connected and committed to God's community and then I'm going to issue you a couple of challenges, okay? And then we're going to be done. All right, so the first benefit I want to give you for belonging and being part of a community of faith, a church, is because a church is a place where people get to know your name. That, that should happen in the church. The, the church is a place where people get to know your name. One, one, of, the, one of the deepest human needs for each and every single person on this planet is to be known. To know and to be known. I mean, I mean, think of it. When you walk into a place and somebody knows your name, there's just, there's just something about that, isn't it? I mean, there, there's just this feeling that you, get, you just feel all good inside when you walk into a place and somebody actually knows your name. There's a uh, Chinese restaurant that's, at my direct, up the street here that uh, as a staff we used to go to all the time. Brad came and we quit going there for some, I think, I don't know if you got banned or what happened, but uh, no, we used, to, we used to go to this place as a staff all the time, way too much in fact, to the point that we would go there so often that when we would walk in, the lady who owned the restaurant, immediately she would say, hey Doug, and, and, and then she would take us to our special place where we sat and Typically, she wouldn't even bring out menus because she knew what we ordered. And there was just something that made me feel like, like I'm kind of important, you know? When I walked in, and she knew my name. In fact, again, we probably went there too much because Laura and I were going to have takeout one time. You remember that? We were going to have takeout one time, and Laura called, and I decided to try something different than I normally try. And the lady argued with Laura. It's like, no, Doug doesn't like that.
he always gets this. And so there's, there's, there's something about that. When somebody knows your name, it just makes you feel good on the inside. That I'm not, I'm not just a number, I'm actually a name. And while it's great to be known in a rest, maybe not so great, but while it's great to be known other places, I think it's even better when we're known by the family of God. Jeremiah 1.5 tells us that before God formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you. He knew you, that you're known by God. And the reason that we love and follow God, the reason that we're drawn to God is not because we know him, but because he knows us. He knows all of our good things, our bad things, our beauties and our warts and everything in between. He knows us and he loves us. And because he knows us, he knows that we need to be plugged into a community where we are known and and can know other people. We weren't created to live in isolation, folks. We were were created to live in the context of a community where we're known. And here's the deal. In the church, it's not that everybody needs to know everybody. But everybody does need to know somebody. Everybody doesn't need to connect to everybody. I mean, it's, again, it's unrealistic. Jesus himself, he called 12. There were the crowds. There were the 72 disciples. There were the 12 apostles. And there were the three that were a part of his inner circle. Even Jesus, I mean, there were different levels of connection. And so it's not that everybody has to be connected to everybody, but everybody needs to be connected to somebody. All right, so we need to to be in a place in the church. The benefit of the church is where people get to know your name. Number two, in the church, people will help carry your burdens. I mean, we're we're functioning the way that we're supposed to to function. The part of the benefit is that we have people around us to be with. When life falls apart, when we think it's going to take a right turn and it takes a left turn, when we think it's going to go uphill and it goes downhill instead, we need people around us who will help us carry our burdens. And the truth is, we all have times in our lives where we're going to face things that that are too difficult for ourselves. Scripture says this, and this has nothing to do with how spiritual you are or not. It says, the rain is going to fall on the just and the unjust alike. In in other words, all of us are going to experience difficulties. The question is, will we experience them alone and have to carry the full brunt of it alone? Or are we going to open ourselves up to where we have people who will come alongside of us and help us carry our burdens? I was thinking about that this past week. And as I, I think back over my own life and some of the things that I've had to face in my own life. And listen, my, my story is not like a rosy one and an easy one. I mean, Laura and I, we've had to face some difficult things in our lives. But as I look back on that, I have no doubt in my mind that there is no way I would be standing here in this place today if it weren't for the people that we surrounded ourselves with, that in those moments where we couldn't carry it, they came alongside of us and they sat with us and cried with us and they encouraged us and they prayed for us and they helped us carry what we couldn't carry all by ourselves. I'm saying this as your pastor, I don't think I'd be here. Today, if it weren't for folks like, in the last seven years that we've been here, there have been people who have come alongside of us and cared for us and helped us carry the burdens we have. The, the bottom line is this. We really do need each other. We need each other. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 6. He says this. Carry each other's burdens and in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. I mean, I mean, if you're a person who, you know, has like all of Scripture memorized, it's a good thing to memorize Scripture. But if you're not living in relationship with other people, if you're not helping other people carry their burdens, according to Paul, you're not fulfilling what you've memorized. It only comes in the context of community. Last one is this. In the church... 
people challenge us to change. In the church, people challenge us to change. We're going to talk about growth here uh, next week, but, but let, me, let me just give you this this morning. What I think, I think, I think this is one of the most powerful recipes for growth that there is. It's, it's more powerful than reading any self-help book that you can read. It's more powerful than taking any class. It's more powerful, if you can believe this or not, as brilliant as I am to be sitting here and listening to me. I say that tongue-in-cheek. This is the most powerful recipe, I'm convinced, for spiritual growth. It's simply investing in relationships with other Christ followers. You want to grow spiritually? Hang out with other Jesus people. Have Jesus conversation. Just do life with other people who are followers of Jesus. Spend, spend time together, allowing them to encourage you and challenge you. This is the recipe for, it's the greatest recipe for growth that I can think of. We don't grow in isolation. We grow in community with other believers. Proverbs 27, 17 talks about this. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. We need to sharpen each other. We need to let each other in into our lives where we can challenge each other and encourage each other and sharpen each other. And we sharpen each other when we invest in each other. We sharpen in each other when we spend time with each other, when we challenge each other. All right, so, so, so here's the challenges, two challenges I want to give you. All right, here, here's the deal. Everything that we've talked about this morning, nobody can do it for you, except for you. No, no, nobody can do it for you, except for you. As much as I wanna see every person who calls Connecting Point Church, their church connected with other people in the church, I cannot build those connections, I cannot invest in those connections for you. In, in fact, I'm convinced the solution is not another program. We don't need another program, we need a culture. That's what we really need. A culture where, you know, it's just kind of normal that we love each other. We hang out with each other. We enjoy getting together with each other. We enjoy spending time with each other. Who, people who are part of the church outside of this setting. And, and so here's the challenge. The, the num Number one this morning, a couple of them. Number one is I, I'm going to pray and dismiss here in just a minute. And when I do, don't just rush out of here when I say amen. All right? Don't, don't, just, don't just bail. Instead, before you leave, find somebody you've never met before and walk up to them and introduce yourself. Just get to know somebody you don't know, all right? Now, I know all of the introverts just went, ooh, like that, all right? So if you see somebody standing in a corner looking scared, don't make them come to you, go to them, all right? And I know some of you have never done this before. It's just like, I don't even know how to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you, okay? So like you see somebody you don't know, and you walk up to them, and you say this. Hi, my name's Doug. Now don't say your name's Doug if your name's not Doug, because that would be weird. But whatever your name is, say, hi, my name's Doug. I don't think we've met before. And they'll say, hi, I'm Bob. If their name is Bob, they'll say, hi, I'm, I'm Bob. Nice to meet you. And then, and then you can follow that up with the question like, so, have you been attending Connecting Point for a long time? And they'll be like, yeah, I've been here for about 15 years. <laughs> You're like, wow, we've never met before. And, and, and then, if, if you really want to go for it, you can say something like, you know, what is it that you like most about the church? And, and then, if somebody asks you that, you say, well, I just love our pastor. Uh, is, no. What, what, what is he like? Or... You can say this one. So what do you do for a living, Bob? That's a good question. Just get to know somebody. Have a conversation. The, the point is, you know, if you do this, now you know at least one person. Next week you can go back and you know somebody's next. Bob, we talked last week. How's your week been? It's been good. How was yours, Doug? It's great to see you again. We have a connection that's taking place there. All right, so that's challenge number one. I'm not even going to ask you how many are going to do it because I'm not going to make some of you lie. 
because you'll all raise your hands. But it's a challenge. It's serious. The, the second challenge is this. Make some effort to get together with someone in the church outside of this setting over the next 30 days. Just, just make, just somebody you can hang out with. Uh, go, go grab a cup of coffee. Go have lunch. Go invite them over for a, a game night or to watch a football game. Just make an effort to hang out with some, somebody. Hang out with somebody. Just enjoy being with somebody. You, you see, what happens is, is when we just do life together, I'm telling you this, some of the greatest, most impactful moments in my life, we think of, we think of discipleship, and we tend to think of a setting where there's like this talking head in a class and he's feeding us information and we get that information fed to us and we've been discipled. No. Jesus said this when he said, go and make disciples. What he said was, in your going, go make disciples. In your, in your going. So wherever you, see, our problem is this, is we, we want to compartmentalize our lives to say, you know, well, we're talking about making disciples. There's not really much spiritual about sitting and watching a football game together. Not very spiritual to go fishing together or go play golf. Can I tell you some of the most impactful spiritual conversations I've ever had have been in a golf cart or in a boat or in a car going to a place? I'm telling you. We, we want to make this is our spiritual life and this is our secular life. Come on, can I tell you, once you've given your life to Jesus, there's no such thing as a secular life. It's all a spiritual life. In your going, hang out with people. And what happens is, is that you know, even today, next week, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to make myself feel bad, but next week if I were to ask you, what are the three benefits of being involved in a church? Most of you couldn't recall one of them. I'm telling you this, when you do life with somebody and life happens, all of a sudden my world starts to fall apart. I get that call from the doctor or, or, or I have this relationship issue or uh, the police call me and my kids done something or whatever it is. The people that have invested in my life, when they come alongside of me and they pray for me and they care for me and they surround me, those are things I will never, ever forget in my life. We can't have that benefit without investing in the relationship. So if the weather was nicer, I'd say the most spiritual thing you could do is go fishing with somebody else who's a believer. Amen, Jerome. The most spiritual thing that you could do is go, go shopping together. One, th this last week, somebody contacted me and said, hey, I've been thinking about this. Are there very many like um, stay-at-home moms in the church with small children? She, they have two small children. She said, I'm just thinking about getting a group together and just kind of hanging out weekly and just you know going to the park or going and doing this. I'm like, yes! That's like one of the most spiritual things you could do. And, and so that's the challenge. Hang out with somebody. Build a relationship with somebody. Do what Jesus did. I think there were more lessons taught when Jesus and his disciples were walking down the road and they're just engaging in conversation than when Jesus stood on mountains and delivered sermons. I just believe that. I think what he delivered on the mountain was a summary of the long conversations that took place while the people were just hanging out with him. And so that's the challenge. Uh, that's the, I should say, this is the, your mission, should you choose to accept it. All right, stand with me and let's pray together. Father, uh, we're so thankful that you created us the way that you created us, that you built us for connection, to be connected to you. And today we celebrate the, the, the 10 or so who lifted their hands today and said, hey, I'm choosing to walk with you and receive you. And we just celebrate that. It's awesome. There ain't nothing better than that. We celebrate the fact that you've blessed us with each other. That, that we have the benefit, here we are in a church full of people, and we have the benefit of having, being. we don't have to go out and look somewhere. We're here. We can build relationships with each other, and some of the best, who knows, we may meet somebody today when we walk up and introduce ourselves that 30 years from now we'll look back on and say, man, that, this is the best friendship I've ever had in my life. I pray that would happen today. But help us to be intentional. 
Help us to help us to take bold steps and have courage and invest. Take the time. It takes time. We need you to help us do that. Help us to be connected to you and connected to other people. And then help us to invite other people to join in on the connections. And so, Lord, we're just going to give this to you. I pray you bless us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.